that the communion part of the service is set up on the table in front here. Uh, this is two weeks. This is not something that's going to happen forever. Uh, but since, uh, given the nature of St. Mary's congregation and busyness and activities and all the rest of it, uh, not everybody is here Sunday by Sunday. I thought it would be appropriate to do it two or three Sundays, uh, just so you get a feel uh, for how it is to, to have the consecration happening here. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. You know, we're, we're, we're in an evolutionary stage as far as how we do liturgy at St. Mary's, and so we'll see whether that's something that gains traction that, that, that seems to minister. So I just want to say that. Um, I, I, just, I just want to play around with words a little bit today, or play around with stories just a little bit to start. Um, every year, churches in the diocese, uh, in the churches of the diocese, and in fact most other denominations have the same thing, though they may call it something different. We have what's called an annual vestry meeting. And for those of you that may not know what an annual vestry meeting is, it is the meeting of the vestry that happens once a year. And who is the vestry? The, the vestry is people who have a vested interest in the parish, um, and we have defined vested interest in the parish as people who have attended once in the past year and have contributed at least a dollar to the well-being of the parish. The standard, the bar, is not that high. So the vestry meets once a year, and uh, the vestry meets to uh, elect some people to positions, and to transact such other business. Isn't that a great phrase? I love that phrase. Transact such other business as may properly come before the meeting. It sounds a lot fancier than our meetings actually are. But imagine if this was the scenario next year when we had our annual vestry meeting. Let's just say that Gail was to come to me two days before the, the meeting and do something like this. She never would because it's just not Gail. You know, but just say a, a, a person whose name happens to be Gail, certainly not our Gail. Gail. Lord, I can't take it anymore. The pressure is too great. I cannot be the people's ward any longer. I can't bear it one more day. You know, and, and she was to quit as people's ward. Again, for those of you that don't know this, um, Gail uh, has been people's ward here, or warden here, for, for quite a number of uh, of, of years, so I would understand, in fact, well, sadly, if she was to decide that she had enough, but uh, it would never happen like that. So let's just say, though, that <coughs> shortly before the vestry meeting, uh, we don't have the person who was to be nominated for the position of people's ward. And so the rector shows up for the annual vestry meeting, as I would in that case, because it's not a long weekend and not the first long weekend in the spring where I wear shorts and no clerical shirt. Uh, I would be dressed formally in my clericals, and I would chair the meeting, and I would get to the point for the election. Do you wonder if this is actually going anywhere? It really is. Uh, and it gets to the point where we actually have the elections and appointments of officers for the church. And I was to say to the congregation, ladies and gentlemen, the person who was wonderfully our, our people's warden for so long, a while ago, has decided that it's timely for her to step down and make room for another person to come, and so we've got to choose a new person. And here's how we're going to do it. Are you ready? You ready for this? Great. Please be ready. Here's how we're going to do this. I have in my hand, well, I don't have anything in my hand, pretend. I have in my hand a bunch of little pieces of paper. One of these pieces of paper, all of these pieces of paper are blank, except one of these pieces of paper has a cross on it. It wouldn't be an X or a little circle, because we're a church, right? And uh, you, want, you want to use gilt where possible. Uh, so it would be a cross. All of you will receive, except for one person, a blank piece of paper. One of you will receive a piece of paper with a cross on it. That is to indicate to you that the Lord has chosen you as the successor to Gail go. So what do you think of my methodology? Walter said something and I really don't think I want to know what he said. Take off the cross. <laughs> uh, take off the cross. Um, when Richard read that reading before, uh, the, 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 about the choosing of Matthias, that's almost what it was like, folks. It's kind of weird. Here you've got this group of people who we like to see, or I hope we like to see them, 
as kind of holy, you know. They've been living with Jesus for three years. They've been hearing his teaching. They've been seeing the things that he did. Uh, he'd be talking to them about the meaning behind the actions. Like these, we like to think of the disciples as, as really, at least a little bit having it together. Because after all, we get to read the stories. They were living the stories. Like they were, they were part of it. But yet, here's what happened. After Jesus was crucified, after he rose, in fact, they looked around one day and realized, we're short a disciple. We're short a disciple. Because, as you know, and I hope you don't think I'm patronizing you or treating like idiots, what had happened was, there was this small matter of the betrayal by Judas, and after the betrayal, Judas was overcome with guilt, so we read, duh, and his response to his guilt was to do something that really is an angry as well as selfish act, and it was to kill himself. Uh, made, it, made the betrayal about himself, Judas, and his feelings, rather than, but anyway, don't go there, that's for another time. And so he killed himself, and so all of a sudden you had had 12 disciples, and now you got 11. So then look at what happens. So after Jesus killed himself, uh, there was uh, Jesus, Jesus died, he rose, he associated with the disciples, he ate with them, he talked to them, he gave them some more marching orders, and then, then comes ascension, and he's no longer there. So the disciples are hanging around saying, so what do we do now? Uh, first he was here, then he was gone. Then he came back, surprised, and now he's gone again. What do we do? And so what they did was what most of us do, where we're in a position where things are happening around us, things are evolving, and we're not really sure what's going on or what's going to happen. What we tend to do as human beings is revert to type or revert to behaviors, kinds of, kinds of behaviors, that are habitual for us, where we find a comfort zone. And so that's what the disciples did for the most part. They hung around and said, well, Jesus had 12 disciples. Things seem to be falling apart, but we don't want them to fall apart. We want them to move forward. So now that we, got look, we, have, we have to get another one. Uh, I will challenge anyone to find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus says, folks, we're going to be, he doesn't say folks, that's my translation. Uh, you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. Um, go and wait in Jerusalem until you clothe the power from on high, but first elect a twelfth disciple, because guys, twelve. It's not there. He never said anything like that. But they were reverting to type. Jesus had twelve disciples, he must have had a reason. We've got twelve disciples. So then they would probably sit around and have what we would call a parish council meeting, before their annual vestry meeting, and discuss, well, um, why did Jesus have 12 disciples? There must be some deep meaning to Jesus having 12 disciples. And they would sit and they would try to find the inner glorious meaning of Jesus choosing 12 disciples. And somebody, probably who went to theological school, would say in an Oxbridge accent, because that's what you do when you go to theological school, whether you've ever been to England or not, I know the will of the Lord. Yeah, right, you come from Point St. Charles, talk like a Point St. Charles. Anyway, I know what God wants. You see, this is what was in Jesus' mind. Old Testament, 12 tribes of Israel. New story here, 12 disciples get it. Get it, get it? So there's the parallel, right? There's the synergy. There's the magic waiting to happen. So, what's going to happen is, if we get disciple number 12, and the team is, 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 is back together, it's going to create a spiritual power grid because the number will be restored, and everything's going to take off, and it's going to be magnificent. That would only happen at a parish council meeting, by the way, because it's just so unreal. It's not even <coughs> so that's what they would do. They would say, we've got to get, Jesus had a reason, we've got to get it back to the way it was. 
You know, we in church do that all the time. Not in such a silly way. But you know what? If only things were the way they used to be, people would come back to church. And I don't need to sing that song these verses. But we tend to do that. When there's a crisis or we're not certain as to what comes next, we revert to time. And that's necessarily what God is doing. So, they have their annual vestry meeting. Uh, the meeting. Peter, of course, does what clergy do. Uh, he talks too much, doesn't shut up, and doesn't listen. Okay? So that's what clergy do. Uh, you're not allowed to laugh too long. And so he stands up and he says this thing, starting with brethren. You know, uh, whenever anyone starts a speech by saying brethren, you know that they don't have a clue what they're talking about. They're just making it up as they go along, and they're trying to make it sound holy. So Peter is as lost here as everybody else is, because there was no roadmap, folks. We have 2,000 years of how the story has unfold, unfolded, and we have the stories, and we still mess it up. Then there was no roadmap. This was all brand new for them, so of course it's going to be, you know, and so Peter is nervous, he's uncertain, he's anxious. I know I'm interpolating somewhat into the text, but you can, see, you, can, you can sort of see it there. And so they're going to refer to time. And so we'll have a word of prayer. Have you ever been to a meeting that starts with, let's have a word of prayer? Every, every group has their own jargon. Um, do you know about the evangelical just? No. There's some, you know, ev evangelical, well, there's the evangelical just. Let's pray. That's the Anglican way of doing it. Let us pray. The evangelical way is, let's just pray. And then everybody immediately does what all Christians do when you say, let us pray. And because this is a sermon, you're not doing it. But if it wasn't a sermon and I was to do it, you would. Uh, you would immediately go, okay? Uh, like the drugs get big time right there. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so you close your eyes and you bow your head. And a lot of people, they're really not praying, they're thinking what they're having for lunch, uh, or that they should have gotten an extra cup of coffee before coming into the service, because the service is boring. Uh, but everybody does this. So the evangelical just is, well, Lord, we just want to thank you. We are just so grateful that you're here. We, we, we just want to come. Everybody has their own. Mary's laughing. You know the evangelical just. Uh, Anglicans have their own way. Catholics have their own way. Pentecostals have their own way. Uh, we all have our own life. We revert to time. Okay? And so that's what they're doing. And of course, since this is a holy thing they're doing, like, come on, replacing a disciple, um, even if their methodology doesn't match up with their intent, they're going to act like it does. So they're going to have a word of prayer before asking God to bless a lottery. And so, and here I'm, I'm sort of in, taking this and, and, and structuring it funny, but so, there they all are, the whole group of them. They have singled out a few people, and now it's going to be between these two. It's going to be Miss Universe and runner-up number one. Well, I mean, not Miss Universe, but Mr. Disciple. And they have a piece of paper. They're probably having more fun than you are. But anyway, uh, they have the pieces of paper. And, and, and one of them is going to be, and then it happens piece of paper with the cross on it, next to something. Matthias. Matthias. Matthias God. Way to go, dude. Okay, I have a question for you. And all of you, and this is not a rhetorical question, I truly want an answer. Aside from the fact that we have a St. Matthias Church, you know, on Church Hill in Westmount, and there are other St. Matthias Churches, and there are anecdotal historic things written for others. Name something you know about St. Matthias that's not mentioned in that particular story. Anything? Where do you ever hear about Matthias ever again? Nobody? You don't. You don't. There's nothing about Matthias ever. Now, let me suggest a different scenario. The disciples have done it this way, and I'm not trying to suggest that God is disinterested in our structures and the way we do things, or that he has decided to take an all-inclusive part of our for a while while we're having our annual vestry meeting, though if I were God, I would. Um, 
the, 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 the reality is, is that's not the way God works. It tends not to be the way God works, perhaps, is, is, is a better way of wording it. The way God tends to work, we'll see a lot more clearly next week. See, this is the Sunday after Ascension Day. It's the last Sunday of Easter season. Next Sunday is Pentecost. And we are going to hear some truly remarkable things. Truly remarkable things. Well, you're going to start hearing about them today. If you want to go back to the Old Testament, start thinking about some images in the Old Testament for the Holy Spirit. Think of when the people of Israel were being led by God from one place, uh, you might say one state of existence to another, from the Egyptian captivity. And however you understand that, uh, it is historic. The, the, the people of Israel were, were, were slaves in Egypt for a significant period of time. And that that captivity ended at a significant period of time. And so just, just, just remember the story. Uh, and remember maybe the pictures you drew in Sunday school of that story. Because you actually do learn some stuff in Sunday school that, that, that really does have a value. Do you remember drawing a picture or reading a story or seeing a movie where when the people of Israel were, were, were on their journey, they were led during the day by a tornado? Uh, that's what it was. They were, they were led by a, 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 a pillar of cloud, a whirlwind. Um, that's a tornado. Uh, it was a visible representation that God was leading them from one place to another. Now, I hasten to add, the people of Israel were often tempted to, and often did, revert to type as well. Uh, we had it so much better in Egypt. We were slaves, but at least we had yogurt and garlic and cucumbers to eat. There's a diet for you, uh, living on Arabola. Uh, and, and, and now we're brought out into the desert to die. But even in the midst of that, there was that pillar of cloud during the daytime. The, if you were on the journey, it was always <coughs> there. It was always there. It was a manifestation of the presence of God, which we call the Holy Spirit. And then, at the night time, so that they wouldn't feel alone and isolated, it was a pillar of fire. And, and well, there you go. Uh, when you're alone and hungry and scared of predators, uh, animal and human, and you're wondering what's coming next, and, you know where you were, but you really have no idea where you're going. But you're in a dangerous place. Like that there, this image that represents the power of God. So what's going to happen on Pentecost has great precedent all through the Old Testament. I'm just picking on one, one aspect of it. Because what we see on the day of Pentecost is not a vesture meeting getting it right, or a parish council voting 11 to 2 in favor of the next action. What we see is a sovereign acting of God, and that acting manifests in a working of the Holy Spirit, which is described in the same terms as I've been describing the people of Israel's journey from slavery to freedom, being led by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And suddenly, there was the sound like a rushing mighty wind, and it, it, it filled the room. It was, it was, it was almost like a freight train. Rushing mighty wind. You get that image of the world at the end of the tornado. And then, after that, or simultaneously, and there appeared something that just looked kind of like tongues of fire. And on each one of them. And that filled the room too. So all of a sudden, these disciples who had so reverted to type are being brought by God into a completely new place. Just like the people of Israel of old, who were delivered by God through human intervention, 
uh, and were led, so it is the case with, with the church. There's a whole bunch of human beings doing their best, but as human beings, sometimes our best isn't, isn't enough, isn't the word, that we're just not resourced or equipped to do what needs to be done. And so God here acts sovereignly, quite independent of the intelligence, the skill set, or the goodwill of those disciples gathered in that upper room. And of course, you know what I'm going to suggest is that one of the things that I believe God so much wants to do in the church today <coughs> is behave sovereignly despite the intelligence, the skill set, and the best intentions of his faithful people gathered. Now please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Uh, when we look at the working of the Holy Spirit, we see, and oh boy, it's, this, this is so many parts to it. We see, in effect, two ways <coughs> the Holy Spirit works in us and for us. One way, the Holy Spirit evokes from us, from our heart, from our spirit, from our mind, that we offer our human, though God-given, of course, talents, skills, and abilities to Him for use according to His purposes. And as I've said so many times, like, this is an incredibly skilled and, and, and resourced and resourceful congregation. Uh, it's, 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 it's phenomenal. And God wants us to offer, as we do, those gifts. Because when you offer them, that's what they are. They're gifts to God and to His community and to the world of our time, our talent, <coughs> our resources. Uh, that's one thing the Holy Spirit does. He, uh, I, I want to use an old word here, He quickens our spirit, to, which means brings to life our spirit to offer those things. And God in the Holy Spirit receives them, blesses them, and in so doing, our normal human attributes and skills become available, useful, and purposed for a divine purpose. And we see the results of that offering, that gifting, um, as quite disproportional to what was offered in the first place, because it is being added to by the Holy Spirit. That is, if you will, what the Spirit evokes from us. But there's something else as well. There's a different, or a, 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 another aspect. Uh, complementary, though different. And that is the anointed gifts of the Holy Spirit. That not as only does the Spirit inspire us, quicken our spirit to offer what we have and what we are to God for His purpose, but He also anoints us. And that's what the symbolism of the tongues of fire that appear on their heads on the day of Pentecost is all about. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit coming upon them, not evoking from within, but coming upon them. Um, different from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit generally was not available to God's people. Uh, that was not what the Old Covenant was about. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, was part of the anointing of kings, for kingly purpose. Uh, when a prophet became a prophet, they were anointed with oil and with the Holy Spirit, for the spirit of prophecy, which is about God's spirit. But for the average person in the pew, so to speak, that, that, that just wasn't the way it was. The Holy Spirit was available for specific purposes for a specific ministry. What we see on the, uh, what we see on the day of Pentecost is the universalizing of the gift of the Holy Spirit for all faithful people. That means you and me. And so on the day of Pentecost, what we see after that event is something very different from a group of people, well-intentioned people, cloistered in an upper room, figuring out what to do next and reverting to type. Let's have a lottery to find a successor. After that sovereign working of the Spirit of God, we see something incredibly different. We see the same people who had barricaded themselves in for fear, out in the streets, talking, 
about the story. They were telling the story of Jesus. And it really seems that a lot of them, for a lot of time, spent a lot of time doing just that. Not just at church on Sundays, where it's safe, but in the marketplace, in the streets, in the places of employment. Wherever they were, whatever they did, they were prepared and ready, because of that anointing of the Spirit, to give a reason for the hope that they had. First Peter on the day of Pentecost, and I don't want to get into a sermon because I'm going to talk about it next. But then you see it, you see it in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, which really we call the Acts of the Holy Spirit, how they ask sick people and heal, it just goes on and on and on and on and on. So what I wanted, I wanted to get across this morning, and I think it's, it's, it's absolutely, I'm never saying anything, you believe, I do believe, it's absolutely crucial, is I really believe that one of the things that God wants us in the church to do is to rediscover, is awaken a good word, I'm not sure if it is, but to rediscover that aspect of the sovereign working of God's Spirit. Yeah, to use all our natural human gifts and talents and abilities and skills and intelligence and knowledge and all the rest of the first purposes. Absolutely. Without question. But to understand, to internalize, to understand and internalize that there's another aspect of God's working that is transcendent and sovereign. And our position is to be that of the receiver. Pure and simple. And when we put ourselves in a position to receive, to allow ourselves to receive that blessing, that anointing of God's Holy Spirit, it transforms. It transforms our lives, it transforms our church community, and it transforms the world around us, just as we see as an example in the early history of the church. It won't be perfect, but it sure will be glorious. So let's pray. Yeah. God, we thank you for your transcendent working in the past. Uh, think of all those times in the Old Testament. Uh, refer today to the, you know, the story of the pilgrimage of the people, your people in, in the wilderness, um, and how you led them. Thank you for that. Thank you for the anointings we see in the Old Testament of kings and prophets and leaders. But we also do recognize that um, that's not just historic, but is to be our present reality as well. Uh, you think of the, the, the rituals and ceremonies and sacraments that we have in the church, like baptism and confirmation, which are supposed to be re-experiencing of these things, but sometimes, you know, get relegated to, you know, just reenactment or, or, or a memory. So God, please, in your church today, open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Let us know, experience, and feel the power that you have to transform our lives, our community, and your world. To the benefit of people and to your glory. Amen.